Well, we are at Revelation 21. We just finished talking about uh, the millennium, and I think I'm going to just do a fast review of that and then just keep right on going. Kind of, It kind of helps just to kind of get your mind in that right frame when we do a little bit of review, hopefully. Um, but just to back it up to chapter 20, when it says, Then I saw an angel come down, coming down from heaven, holding the key of the abyss and a great chain in his hand, and he laid hold of the dragon, the serpent of old, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. We talked about how during the time of Christ, how Christ bound the strong man and then uh, overtook his house. You remember that from Matthew 13? And so we see this binding that actually happened here isn't something in the future. It's something that happened back in the time of Christ. And, what, what, and of course, we know this is just a vision, so Satan wasn't literally uh, tied up in a chain or anything, but this, the, the, this vision shows that God put boundaries on Satan. He was no longer able to deceive the nations as he had done prior to that. And so while Satan can still do a lot of trouble, cause a lot of trouble, he goes about roaring like a lion seeking whom he may devour. He can no longer deceive the nations as he used to. And we see that when that happened at the same time, that happened during Christ's ministry, then when Christ ascended into heaven, opened up the seals, we saw the white horse going out, conquering and to conquer, which is the gospel. And so we see Satan was bound, couldn't deceive the nations, the gospel going forward. And since that time, 2,000 years ago, the gospel's gone nearly to every place on this planet. And I don't know, I read one time, but I don't remember what the number is, I wish I did, but the number of languages now that, that uh, the Bible's been translated to is in the thousands. So it's, it's just amazing. So Satan's been bound, he couldn't do that. He can do a lot of other stuff, but he, could, he, couldn't, he couldn't stop the gospel from going forward. He couldn't de deceive the nations like he used to. Well then, it says here in verse 4, 20, verse 4, Then I saw thrones, and they sat on them, and judgment was given to them. And I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded because of their testimony of Jesus, and because of the word of God, and those who had not worshipped the beast or his image, and had not received the mark on their forehead and on their hand. And they came to life and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. And that's talking about all those who died in Christ. They had not received the mark. And remember we showed how the mark of the beast it wasn't an actual physical mark because we saw that also earlier we saw that, that God's people were given a seal on their forehead. And that seal on their forehead is also not something we can see. These are, this is a vision. And so just as, just as God's people are in the vision have a seal put on their forehead that they're God's people and they're protected, in that same language, those who are in the kingdom of darkness have a mark put on their hand or their forehead. And so both of them, in the vision, it's a seal. In the vision, it's a mark. But what it stands for, those who are, uh, had the seal of God on their forehead, we see in Ephesians 1 that they have the seal of the Holy Spirit. They've been sealed by the Holy Spirit until, until the day of redemption. Those who have the mark of the beast, since this is something that goes from the cross to the end of the world, not just at the end. It's just simply a, a, a vision uh, showing those who are in the kingdom of darkness. Every single person uh, on this planet has either the seal of God on their forehead or the mark of the beast on their hand or their forehead. Uh, they're, in this, they're in these visions. They're in the kingdom of Christ or they're in the kingdom of darkness. Now, there's no doubt that some things have manifested throughout history where there actually has been types of marks and symbols for different things. Back in the days of the Roman Empire, when uh, Christians were being martyred, they set up these little uh, like mini sanctuaries around the Roman Empire that were for emperor worship, and the Christians and everyone else had to go to these places once a year. They had to bow down and burn incense and pray to the emperor. And, and, and say Caesar is Lord. If they did not do that, it often cost them their life. If they did it, they would get some kind of a token that they had done that, and then they could go on living their life. And, and that would be 
you know, that, that, that looks kind of like this Mark of the Beast thing played out. But uh, the Mark of the Beast is actually, it's more than that. It's anyone who's in the kingdom of darkness. And so what it says here, and I saw the souls of those who have been beheaded, those who were martyred, because of their testimony of Jesus and because of the word of God, and those who had not worshipped the beast or his image and had not received the mark on their forehead and on their hand. That's talking about anyone who's been saved. And they came to life and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. And so Christ came, he bound Satan from deceiving the nations, and all the Christians throughout the thousand-year period, which is a symbolic number for the whole church age, as they, when they died, their spirits went to heaven, and they've been reigning with Christ the whole time. The rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were completed. This is the first resurrection. <clears throat> the rest of the dead, those who did not die in Christ, they did not come to life. They actually they went to hell. That's where they went. Blessed and holy is the one who has a part of the first resurrection. Over these, the second death has no power. But they'll be, present, they'll be priests of God and of Christ and will reign with him for a thousand years. And so um, the, the, that first resurrection um, is interesting. Uh, when Christ died on the cross and he said it's finished, remember the saints that came out of the graves and so on. I mean, just really interesting, just, just showing the power that Christ had there. And, and um, the saints came out of the graves. And I think that was a prelude to what will happen at the very end. But that first resurrection, when you die and you go in the grave and your spirit goes to heaven, okay, now you've, that's, you've, you've been resurrected. Now your spirit's in heaven, reigning with Christ for a thousand years. And the person who's participated in that first resurrection, the second death has no power. So what is the second death? Well, the, the, the first death, you could say, um, you could call it our spiritual death before we have Christ, or you could call it when we physically die. Uh, it goes back and forth between theologians, but bottom line, there's a, that first death, and the second death is if someone's cast into the lake of fire. The person who partakes in the first resurrection, they've been born again, their spirit's gone to heaven with the Lord, the second death has no power. Okay, so blessed and holy is the one who has part of the first resurrection over these. The second death has no power, but they'll be priests of God and of Christ and will reign with him for a thousand years. And again, that number is symbolic. And so the thousand is just a huge number that covers the whole church age. We know now it's been over 2,000 years. It doesn't matter if it's longer than that. It doesn't really matter because that thousand years is just the symbolic complete age for the church. Satan freed and doomed um, this is the heading that I got for the next part. It says, when the thousand years are completed, Satan will be released from his prison. In other words, when the church age is about over, Satan's released from his prison and will come out to deceive the nations which are in the four corners of the earth. So he's going to be deceiving once again. Gog and Magog, to gather them together for the war, the number of them is like the sand of the seashore. And so Satan's loose for a little season at the very end of the church age. And when he comes out... He's going back to what he was doing before, deceiving the nations. And, and so we can expect to see at the end, at the very end, close to the end when Christ is returning, a deception to come across the world, a deception coming to the whole world um, where Christianity will still be going strong. It'll never go away until Christ returns. It, it'll get, the church will get beat down, but Christians will still be around and, 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 and God will preserve them. But but there's going to be, just as there was lots and lots of idolatry and false religions and just darkness before Christ came, the Bible says that when Christ came, a, a light has shined into the darkness. That's, that's going to come back. So there'll be false religions, idolatry, just darkness coming into the world. And you know, you kind of are seeing that now, aren't we? That's coming more and more. And so we want, it, it makes you wonder, has Satan been loose for this little season? Don't know, don't know. Wouldn't be surprised. Wouldn't be surprised. And then as Satan deceives the nations, he's going to gather up his people, like the number of the sand of the seashore, to go to war against the saints. <clears throat> well, when it says, and they came up on the broad plain of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints, that's a vision. So John is seeing this broad plain of the earth. 
the camp of the saints, you think about the tabernacle in the wilderness. It's a camp. And it's a camp of the saints in this vision. But it, what does it symbolize? It symbolizes God's church, God's people. And so while the vision shows a camp in a plain, the meaning of it is God's churches throughout the whole world. Satan's people, those who he's gathered up, are going to come against the church really strongly. And we see, if we went back a few chapters, we see where the two witnesses lie dead in the street. The two witnesses is symbolic for the church. The church gets really, uh, there's an onslaught against the church to the point where it looks like the church is dead, though it's not. But it, it will be, it'll be really, it'll be publicly tampered down way really, really strong, but Christ will still be in the hearts of his people. He says the church will be more underground. It'll be really oppressed, really attacked. And then in that chapter what, that talks about the two witnesses, it says that the two witnesses will rise up. In other words, the church will rise up. And it says, And they came on the broad plain of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints and the beloved city, and fire came down from heaven and devoured them. So right when it looks like the church is going to be just destroyed, that's when Christ returns and he devours the enemy. And the devil who deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are also, and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. Then I saw a great white throne, and him who sat upon it, from whose presence earth and heaven fled away, and no place was found for them. We go to the sixth seal, and in the sixth seal, earlier we read how the sun became uh, black and like sackcloth, the moon became as blood. Every mountain and island was moved from their place, the earthquakes and so on. We say all this, and then in that very same place it says, and, and, we, and, and Christ coming on a throne, and hide us from the wrath of the Lamb. Okay, and so that was just a repeat of what was already said earlier at the sixth seal. Christ is coming on a great white throne in this vision. And I saw the dead, the great and the small, standing before the throne. And books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged from the things which were written in the books according to their deeds. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it. And death and Hades gave up the dead which were in them. And they were judged, every one of them, according to their deeds. And so we see, if, 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 if when it talks about the sea giving up the dead and Hades giving up the dead and so on, we, we go to Second Thessalonians and we see where when Christ returns and the, uh, the, the, with a shout and the, arc, and the sound of the archangel uh, talks about those in Christ rising from the grave. And here it talks about the, the, the sea giving up the dead. All the dead will come out of the graves, come out of the sea, come out of everywhere, where they where they where they've died, and 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 um, they'll be before God, before the throne. Uh, the spirits will be united with bodies and glorified if if they've been saved. And spirits will be united with bodies even if they haven't been saved. They just they won't be glorified. We look in Matthew and we see that that Christ is there and he, he puts the sheep on the right and the goats on the left. And this, this, is, this is that scene right now, right here. And, and the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and the death and the Hades gave up the dead which were in them, and they were judged, every one of them, according to their deeds. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death in the lake of fire. And if anyone's name, anyone's name was not writ, found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. And so this, this judgment is there. Uh, the parables talk about separating the good fish from the rough fish, the wheat from the tares, the sheep from the goats, and, and, and we see this judgment happening. The books are open and the book of life. And, and those whose names were not found written in the book of life, they were cast off into, into hell, the second death. Those whose names were found written in the book of life, they were, they were welcomed into heaven. Well done, my good and faithful servant. And so that's what this is talking about. And so you can see this going all the way from the time of Christ when Satan was bound all the way through the church age. When Satan was released for a short time, and judgment comes. And now we're going to look at chapter 21. Any questions on what we just said? This is kind of a quick review. That kind of get the wheels turning a little bit, hopefully. All right, let's look at chapter 21. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth passed away, and there's no longer any sea. And I, I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, made ready as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is among men, 
and he will dwell among them, and they shall be his people, and God himself will be among them. And he will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and there will no longer be any death. There will no longer be any mourning or crying or pain. The first things have passed away. And he who sits on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. And he said, Write, write, for these words are faithful and true. Then he said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give to the one who thirsts from the spring of the water of life without cost. He who overcomes will inherit these things, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. But for the cowardly and unbelieving and abominable and murderers and immoral persons and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars, their part will be in the lake that burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls full of the seven last plagues came and spoke with me, saying, Come here, I will show you the bride, the wife of the Lamb. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me the holy city Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God, having the glory of God. Her brilliance was like a very costly stone, as a stone of crystal clear jasper. It had a great and high wall with twelve gates, and at the gates twelve angels, and names were written on them, which are the names of the twelve tribes of the sons of Israel. There were three great gates on the east and three gates on the north, and three gates on the south and three gates on the west. And the wall of the city had twelve foundation stones, and on them were the twelve names of the twelve apostles of the Lamb. The one who spoke with me had a gold measuring rod to measure the city and its gates and its walls. The city is laid out as a square, and its length is as great as the width. And he measured the city with the rod, 1,500 miles its length and width and height are equal. And there they got the interpretation wrong. And we'll change that. It's not 1,500 miles, because 1,500 miles loses the symbolism. Any of you guys say anything other than 1,500 miles? 1,200 furlongs? 12,000 furlongs. Yeah, that's the correct interpretation. I'll come back to that. But we've already, you've seen what I'm talking about about this. They went and took the 12,000 uh, furlongs and turned it into 1,500 miles. And when they did that, they took the symbolism, the uh, apocalyptic symbolism that's supposed to be there, and turned it into, made it literal there, so that it, like as if it's a narrative and and, and because that's a symbol, they actually got it wrong. And I'm not talking like I know more than these translators. It's just, they just, that just happens. But that's what, that's what happened there. Then all those numbers matter. Every one of them stands for something. And so wherever they did that, they didn't stick to the principle of symbolism. We'll come back to that. Um, the city had, was laid out as, okay, for 17. And he measured its wall. 72 yards, again, that one's not, what does your say, other than 72 yards? That sounds a little different, doesn't it? Sound more familiar, the number 144? It's, there's a reason for it. 144 cubits according to the human measurements, which are also angelic measurements. The material of the wall was jasper, and the city was pure gold like clear glass. The foundation stones of the city wall were adorned with every kind of precious stone. The first foundation stone was jasper, the second sapphire, the third chalcedony, the fourth emerald, the fifth sardonyx, the sixth sardius, the seventh chrysolite, the eighth beryl, the ninth topaz, the tenth chrysoprase, if I said that right, the eleventh jacinth, the twelfth amethyst. And the twelve gates were twelve pearls. Each one of the gates was a single pearl. And the street of the city was pure gold like transparent glass. I saw no temple in it. For the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. And the city has no need of the sun or the moon to shine on it, for the glory of God has illumined it, and its lamp is the Lamb. The nations will walk by its light, and the kings of the earth will bring their glory into it. In the daytime, for there will be no night there, its gates will never be closed, and they will bring the glory and the honor of the nations into it. And nothing unclean and no one who practices abomination and lying shall ever come into it but only those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. Well, let's go back and let's kind of go over this chapter a little bit. What's interesting is we've been looking at this stuff, and <clears throat> we see that it's gone from the cross to the end, and now this part here also goes into eternity. 
It, it, it follows right after the judgment and goes into eternity. And, and earlier in some of the places we saw where the 144,000 were uh, in heaven singing praises to God. So we, some of the other places got into eternity a little ways too, didn't they? This one gets into it a little bit more. But what's interesting, when we look at this, uh, we'll see that while this is talking about eternity, parts of it are referring to now and to eternity. And I'll show you what, what, I, what I mean as we get there. But just going back, it says, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth passed away, and there's no longer any sea. If you hold your spot there and go to Second Peter chapter 3, uh, 2 Peter chapter 3. If you go to 2 Peter chapter 3, And if we go to verse 10. Okay, in Revelation it just said, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first earth passed away and there's no longer any sea. Then we go to 2 Peter 3.10. Now we're going out of symbolic language and we're going into narrative. And so this is not symbolism in 2 Peter. This is, this is narrative. This is what's going to actually happen. It says, but the day of the Lord will come like a thief in which the heavens will pass away with a roar and the elements will be destroyed with intense heat and the earth and its works will be burned up. And so that's what's going to happen. And it says, since all these things are to be destroyed in this way, what sort of people ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness, looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God because of which the heavens will be destroyed by burning and the elements will melt with intense heat. But according to his promise, we're looking for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. So this, Peter wrote this letter and is saying, when the Lord returns, when the day of the Lord comes, it'll come like a thief. And when it comes, the, the heavens, the earth are going to be burned up. The heavens will pass away. The elements will, uh, there'll be a, a loud roar. The elements will be destroyed with intense heat. Everything's going to be burned up and destroyed. And then we see in Revelation then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth passed away and there's no longer any sea. So the, the vision that John had matches what Peter said is going to actually happen. In, in Revelation, it doesn't say it's going to get burned up. He just sees a new heaven and a new earth. Now, this new heaven and this new earth, if we go into the Greek, it's, it's more like a renewed heaven, renewed earth. It's, this, it's more like the, the earth, everything in it's burned up and, yet, and then it's renewed. And so it's not like the planet's disintegrated in a new planet, but a renewal of the earth. And that's, that's what this is talking about. And then in verse 2, And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, made ready as a bride adorned for her husband. And there's, so there's symbolism here of uh, a new Jerusalem, a holy city, and then we see it's made ready as a bride. So when we think of the new Jerusalem, when we think of a bride, in both cases, it's talking about the church. The church is called the New Jerusalem in the Bible. The church is called the Bride of Christ. And so when John sees this holy city in his vision, this, this vision is a picture of the church. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is among men, and he'll dwell among them, and they shall be his people, and God himself will be among them. Now we see it's interesting how back in when the world was first created and Adam and Eve walked this world before any other people were here, we see that God walked with Adam and Eve in the cool of the day. And then when there was sin, sin, remember what sin always does, sin always separates. And God and Adam and Eve were separated. Christ brings us back together. Christ himself made the bridge between God and, and man, between heaven and earth. And, and so God is walking with us now. He, he is actually walking with us now. The Spirit of God lives in us. So there's a, a part of this this is, that's happening right now. There's the now, and then there's the future part. So while, when we're, we're here in the church, and the Bible says that we're two or three are gathered together in his name. There I am in the midst. Christ is in, in this church right now. He's in our hearts. He's really here. But when it says here that 
He'll dwell among them and they shall be his people and God himself will be among them. Now this is talking about not God in our presence by faith, but God in our presence by sight. He is in our presence right now, but we don't see him, but he's here. But when, when in that day in heaven, we'll see him. We'll see him face to face. We'll walk with him. And it says he'll wipe away every tear from their eyes and there'll be no longer... There'll, there'll no longer be any death. There'll no longer be any mourning or crying or pain. The first things have passed away. Everything associated with sin, everything associated with death, pain, mourning, crying, all the things that come about from sin, from fallenness, will be gone. All that will be gone. The first things have passed away, the Bible says. And he who sits on the throne said, Behold, I'm making all things new. And so the Lord's going to make after the day of judgment, after the goats have been departed and the sheep are in heaven, God's going to make all things new, new heavens, new earth. And he who sits on the throne said, Behold, I'm making all things new. And he said, Write, for these words are faithful and true. So John was told, Write these things down. This is faithful, this is true, this is going to happen. And then he said to me, It's done. I'm the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give to the one who thirsts from the spring of the water of life without cost. So this message right here, this is, this is talking about in the future, but it's talking about the here and now. It's both. It's, it's kind of like parts of it are already and parts of it are not yet. And the Alpha and the Omega, that's, talking, that's Jesus Christ. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. It's, 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 God uses the same language as well. I will give it to the one who thirsts from the spring of the water of life without cost. That is... The, the, the church is, is the new Jerusalem, the new Israel, the, uh, the bride of Christ. And, and, and while we have this great vision of the church in the future, the church already is the bride of Christ even right now, and God's perfecting his bride. And here where it says, I will give to the one who thirsts from the spring of water of life without cost. While we'll, we'll, see, we'll see in a moment how it talks about the, river, the rivers of life in heaven, uh, God, Christ right now is giving anyone uh, the one who thirsts from the spring of the life, the water of life right now without cost, isn't he? I mean, right now, people are invited to come to Christ. And they're, they're coming to partake of the, of the springs of the water of life right now. And it's without cost. He who overcomes will inherit these things. And I will be his God and he will be my son. When God saves us, he adopts us, he makes us his children. And as far as overcoming, he causes us to overcome. But for the cowardly and unbelieving and abominable and murderers and immoral persons and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars, their part will be in the lake that burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. And so, again, this, this chapter is referring to the future and the right now. Here it's talking about the people right now, unbelieving, cowardly, abominable, murderers, immoral persons, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars. This is talking about people without Christ, people who are living this way, this is their life. They don't want any part of Christ. They're unbelievers. And their part will be in the lake that burns with fire and brimstone. This is the second death. There's the first death. This is the second death. The second death is forever. Verse 9, Then one of the seven angels, who had the seven bowls full of the seven last plagues, came and spoke with me, saying, Come here, I will show you the bride, the wife of the Lamb. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain. And showed me the holy city of Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God. Now, I don't know if you guys have ever read a book called Heaven by Randy Alcorn. He, he explains it quite well. But if we, if we go into the scripture, we're going to see that um, well, here it's talking about the, the, the new holy city, Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God. When, when God renews the earth, he renews the heavens, renews the earth. The Bible actually teaches something we don't think about too often, but... The Bible teaches that the, that the earth is going to be renewed. The heavens are going to be renewed. We're going to be renewed and glorified. And we're going to, heaven is going to be on this earth. Right now there's heaven, but we see this coming down. And there's other verses that talk about it, that, that even nature groans waiting for the recreation. We see that in Romans 8. This, this, very, this very planet is going to be renewed. And glorified. It, it, the, the Garden of Eden was here at one time. And it's going to be beyond that. And so uh, heaven won't be 
sometimes people think of heaven as something kind of ethereal, something kind of uh, spirit-like. Heaven's going to be solid like, like this, and we're going to have bodies. The, bo the Bible says our very bodies are going to rise from the grave, and they're going to be glorified. Just Christ gave us the example. He showed us how it's going to happen. He died. He was buried in the tomb. His spirit ascended into heaven immediately when he said, it is finished. He said to the thief next to him, today, truly this day, you'll be with me in paradise. And so when Christ died on the cross, Christ immediately went to paradise. So did that thief. Christ's body went in the tomb. Christ's spirit was in heaven. And on the third day, Christ's spirit joined his body. And when Christ's spirit joined his body, his body was glorified and fitted for eternity, and never the same again, but changed forever. And that's a picture of exactly what's going to happen to Christians. Our spirit, when we die, will be immediately in the presence of the Lord in heaven. Our body will go into the grave. And on that resurrection morning, on that resurrection day when Christ comes, our, our bodies and our spirits will be joined just as Christ's body and spirit was joined. And our bodies will be glorified and made like Christ's body just as Christ's body was glorified and will be fitted for eternity. It's interesting to think about, isn't it? And, and the whole world will be changed. I don't like to fly my wife's wanted to go to Hawaii. I gotta say, I'm not going to Hawaii till the new earth, the new earth. <laughs> That's when I'll go to Hawaii if God hasn't if God hasn't changed it. But the whole world will be better in Hawaii, so it won't even matter. But it's <clears throat> it's going to be just a, a whole new. I mean, does that give you? It gives you a picture of what's going to happen, doesn't it? The Lord's going to destroy this earth. He's going to burn it up with fire. Every remnant of sin, every remnant of corruption, every remnant of evil is going to be gone. And it's going to be renewed. And it's going to be glorious. He carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me the holy city Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God. And so the, the bride's coming out of heaven. Having the glory of God, her brilliance was like a very costly stone as a stone of crystal clear jasper. I mean, this, this they're going to describe a city now, but they're describing this city and I understand that this is God's people, this is the church. But they're showing it as a city to show us some of the attributes of what God's church is like. It had a great and high wall with 12 gates. And at the 12 gate, at the tw gates, 12 angels, and, and names are written on them, which are the names of the 12 tribes of the sons of Israel. You, you think about this great and high wall. Okay, so the, this, this is symbolic of the church. It had a great and high wall. And again, there's the already and the not yet. The church already exists now. And yet not yet to fully what it will be. And when we see the great and high wall with 12 gates, you know, what do you think of when you think of a city with a great and high wall? There's a security there, isn't it? There's a security there. And someone who is really a Christian and they're in God's church, whether they're in the building or not, they're in God's church. And uh, I believe it's John 10, 28. It says, and no one can snatch them out of my hand. Isn't that true? I mean, this, this great and high wall is a symbolic way of saying, God's saying, you're safe. You're part of my church. You're part of my people. You're safe. No one can snatch you out of my hand. And so we see the great and high wall. And then we see 12 gates. And at the gate, 12 angels. Why is there 12 gates? Well, 12 gates, for one thing, we always we get the symbolism of the 12 apostles, the 12 tribes of Israel, and so on. But 12 gates of the city, it's like... It's made to enter. It's, it's made to enter. The church, the church is here, and the gates are open, so people come to Christ. Isn't that true? And so right now, you, you, again, it's the already and the not yet. The church right now, you just think of the church, this worldwide church that has its 12 gates. In other words, it's come unto me and be ye saved, all the ends of the earth. That's, that's, that's the mission of the church. That's what Christ is calling out to the world. And at the gates, 12 angels. And so what are these angels doing at the gates? Well, they're guarding the gates. Because while the gates are open and people are told to come to Christ at the same time, if we go back to verse 8, again, it's the already and the not yet, uh, when it says, but for the cowardly and unbelieving and abominable and murderers and immoral persons and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars, 
those 12 angels are guarding and they're not coming into that eternal church. Okay, so that you, it's just symbolic of while the gates are open and people are invited to come to Christ, yet there's, there's angels guarding at the same time. Then we look at, and names are written on them, which are the names of the 12 tribes of the sons of Israel. And so the gates have the, the 12 names of the tribes of Israel. And you go, again, you go back to the tabernacle in the wilderness. And they had the 12 tribes of Israel. And you, you think of this city, and, and we're going to see in a minute this square. And we look at the tabernacle in the wilderness, and there was three tribes to the north, three to the east, three to the south, and three to the west. And it's this vision set up just like that. It's, it's, it, which is, that was a picture of God's people. This is a picture of God's people. There were three gates on the east, three gates on the north, three gates on the south, and three gates on the west. And the wall of the city had 12 foundation stones, and on them were the 12 names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. Why would the, why would the 12 apostles of the Lamb be written on the foundation? I mean, this, all this symbolism is really important. I mean, it's, I mean, again, this is a vision. Heaven actually isn't going to look exactly like how this is. This is a vision. But there's 12 foundation stones, and every one of them has one of the names of the apostles. And why would that be? It's because uh, apostles really laid the foundation for the gospel, didn't they? It's the foundation stones, the apostles, and the chief cornerstone, of course, is Jesus Christ. And so we see the apostles being the foundation stones. The one who spoke with me had a gold measuring rod to measure the city and its gates and its walls. The city is laid out as a square, and its length is as great as the width, and he measured the city with the rod. 1,500 miles, its length and width and height are equal. And, and uh, the 1,500 mile thing, it's, what, what does your say again? 12,000 furlongs. 12, furlongs. Now, we saw all through the book of Revelation the number 12. We saw the number 1,000. We saw 144. We saw things like that. So there's a reason. It's just like there's 12 gates and there's, and there's 12 uh, foundation stones. There are 12 gates that, that signified the 12 tribes, 12 foundations that signified the 12 uh, apostles. And we see uh, 12,000 furlongs. And uh, the number 12... It stands, again, it's kind of a number that stands for the church because 12 apostles, 12 uh, uh, tribes of Israel. And also, another thing about 12, um, some of the theologians like William Hendrickson wrote this, and I think, I think there's really something to this. 12 is 3 times 4, and 3 is the number of the Trinity, and 4 is the number of the earth, north, south, east, and, east, and west. And so we see the, even that kind of symbolism, the the God and, and man together there, the Trinity and the, and the earth, um, times a thousand, times 12, 10,000, right? And so you, you, can, you can think about this, this very size, okay, the, the city is the church of Christ, and this very size, the, the, the 12 church times a thousand, 10,000, symbolically you could say this this. this kind of is numerically standing for the, uh, the multitude that no man can number that will be in heaven. Okay, so it's, it's not meant to actually, they're saying here's the size of the city, but remember this is a vision, so the size of the city is like, how big is this? It's kind of saying, how big is this? And, and, and if you go past just the vision, it's not really looking for how big is this geometrically, because it's a symbol. Just how big is it? And you think about the size of the, the church, the multitudes, and you think about the 12,000 meaning a multitude no man could, could number. And so, and we even go back and we see that 12,000. 12, well, we go back a few chapters and we see when John was seeing 12,000 from this tribe, 12,000 from the, remember we saw that? And, and it added up to, at the very end, it was 144,000. And, and then all of a sudden he was hearing these numbers and all of a sudden his eyes were open and he saw, and what he saw wasn't, 12 tribes with 12,000 in each one. What he saw was a multitude no man could number. And so that vision earlier in the book, when it said 12,000, 12,000, 12,000, did that 12 times, it wasn't talking about an actual 12,000. It said, it, it, it interpreted it. It said, and when he opened his eyes, he, he saw 
a multitude from every tribe, from every tongue, from every nation, nation that no man can number. And so what this is saying is saying the same thing. It's saying the same thing. As he sees this city and it's 12,000 by 12,000, it's saying, it's say, this, is the, this is how big heaven's going to be with God's people. That's what it's saying. And it's not actually saying 1,500 miles. So they kind of lost it in the interpretation right there. Now, I'm, 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 I'm positive of this, that this, this doesn't fit any of the in, interpretive parts that match the rest of Scripture here. And he measured its wall. And here it says 72 yards, but 72 yards, that doesn't mean anything. As, as far, I mean, this is a vision. I mean, it doesn't matter if it's 72 yards or... And there's a reason they give a number in a vision. And what was it again? 144? 144 cubits? And remember what, again, what's 144? 12 times 12. So we see this symbolism, 12 times 12 times 1,000. 12 times 12. Uh, 12,000. Uh, all, all the different combinations of it. And every bit of it's talking about, about, about the, the multitude no man can number. And so we see this wall. It's, it's 144 cubits. And then it talks about according to human measurements, which are also angelic measurements. Um, not quite sure what that means. Uh, the material of the wall was jasper, and the city was pure gold like clear glass. The foundation stones of the city wall were adorned with every kind of precious stone. Now I'm going to back up for just a second. And when it says the city's laid out as a square in verse 16, and then it talks about being 12,000 miles in length and width and height. Now that is really interesting. 12,000. I mean, okay, first of all, let me show you, let me show you how, how things get with, if you start interpreting uh, things that are meant to be symbolic literally. It, it starts getting, just like if you interpret poetry literally, it gets messed up. Okay, if, if you started to interpret this in a literal fashion, not in a symbolic fashion. And so 12,000 furlongs is, is 1,500 miles. Okay, so you imagine a city <clears throat> that's 1,500 miles long. You know, that's, that's like from California to the Mississippi River. You know, I mean, it's, it's big. And then 15 miles in width again, like from Texas to Minnesota, or probably even a little longer. But then what really gets it absurd is then it goes 1,500 miles high. And you go up 60 miles and you're out of the atmosphere. You know, I mean, 1,500 miles is a long ways from Earth. So you see, so you see how that, if you think about that, that, it's not meant to mean that at all. What it's, I mean, even a, a city that would be that high would be, I mean, it just doesn't even really make sense. The reason why it's a square, and the reason why it talks about God dwelling there, and the reason why it says 12,000 by 12,000 by 12,000, the 12,000 is talking about the multitude no man can number. The fact that it's square is highly, highly symbolic. Do you remember something that was perfectly square in the Old Testament that was amazing? When they had the sanctuary in the wilderness, remember they'd set up that sanctuary and there was the, the holiest place, the holy place, and then the holy of holies. Behind that curtain, the holy of holies, the priest, the high priest, could only go once a year and not without blood. Remember that? That holy of holies was perfectly square. The same width, the same depth, the same height. The fact that they're saying this is perfectly square, but 12,000 by 12,000 by, they're saying, this is the Holy of Holies. This is the church of God. This is the bride of Christ. This is the sanctuary. God dwelt in the Holy of Holies in the wilderness. They, they, when they went in there, you, only the high priest could go in there, and, 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 and he had incense burning, so he couldn't even look on the ark. Because it was symbolically where God dwelt. And now so we see this 12,000 by 12,000 by 12,000 talking about the multitude of people in heaven. But the square, the very shape is saying, this is the Holy of Holies. I will dwell with them and they will dwell with me. This is where God dwells. 
That's what this symbolism is. It's not about a, a geographical city that would have, a, would have an absurdity by its sheer height. It's a vision that John sees, and it's, it's like all of a sudden now where God was dwelling, now it's not just the high priest going in there. It's God and his church, the bride, dwelling in the Holy of Holies. So that's what this is talking about. Isn't that interesting? The, the symbolism changes everything. If you understand you're reading a symbol, it starts to make sense. And, you, and again, you don't want to overdrive the headlights. You don't want to read. I mean, just make, keep it simple. And that, that is keeping it simple. You, the squareness is, I mean, you, you, you look at Scripture to interpret Scripture. So you go, where else was, you know, talking about God, top, talking about where God is. And you go right back to the, bring, brings you right back to the, to the sanctuary. It was a perfect square, the Holy of Holies. Couldn't go in there. Now the whole heavens is going to be in there. And we go a little further back to uh, verse 19. The foundation stones of the city wall were adorned with every kind of precious stone. The first foundation stone was jasper, the second sapphire, the third chalcedony, and so on. And we go through all, all of these. And so it's like, okay, here's the foundation stones. The apostles' names are on there. They're foundational. It's what the apostles taught. It's the foundation of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we see that uh, the whole church is resting on this foundation, the, the gospel, and, and, and the fact that it's adorned with these precious stones. I mean, I, I don't know exactly how to interpret that, so I, I, I try to be in a more general way and, and, and go along with what William Hendrickson said on this, that those precious stones, since this is the apostolic message, the gospel, the truths of the, of the New Testament, those stones, would, they could very well represent the, 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 just the truths of the gospel, the, God's attributes, just the beauty of the gospel. Then we go, and the 12 gates were 12 pearls. Each one of the gates was a single pearl. And the street of the city was pure gold, like transparent glass. And so the city, the church, is beautiful. I saw no temple in it, for the Lord God, the Almighty, and the Lamb are its temple. I mean, it's, it's, it's God dwells, we dwelt in his temple. In, I mean, he's omnipresent, but yet there was a way in which he was in his temple in the Old Testament, uh, although the, the Bible says the temple could not even hold him. But now there's no temple because the, the Lord God, the Almighty, the Lamb, are its temple. The city has no need of the sun or the moon to shine for, on it, for the glory of God is illuminated as, and its lamp is the Lamb. And so this, this is just talking about the glory, the brightness, the light of, of God. The nation will walk by its light and the kings of the earth will bring their glory into it. Again, the not yet and the already is going on in these chapters. You just, it's, it's, okay, what is this talking about that's not yet? What is it talking about that's right now? Because the church already exists, the bride of Christ already exists, and the nations will walk by its light. You know, right now, Cross Point Church and every other church in this world that's preaching the Bible, teaching the Bible, teaching the good news, the nations will walk by its light. And, 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 and the churches are the light of the world right now. And, and nations will, walk by it in a sense of passing by it, and walk by it in, sense, in the sense of following it. Some nations have followed it. The United States followed the gospel for a long, long time, and there's still all kinds of Christians in this country. And, and, and you think about the nations walking by its light, and, and, and in heaven, in the future, the nations walking by its light, I don't know what that means. Well, we, we, we know that the the light of God will be in heaven everywhere, and everyone will be walking by that. So, but there's a, there's a sense of even right now, and the kings of the earth will bring their glory into it. In the daytime, for there will be no night there. Its gates will never be closed. Again, the already, the not yet. The already, the, the, in, in a sense, in the symbolic sense, uh, in the church, it's daytime, there is no night there, and its gates are never closed. Already. I mean, the, the church is open, and it's always light. It's always light. And yet, there's a future to this that's going to be more grand and more glorious. And they'll, they'll bring the glory and the honor of the nations into it, and nothing unclean, and no one who practices abomination lying shall ever come into it, but only those na whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. Again, the already, the not yet. The already is right now that nothing unclean, no one who practices abomination lying shall ever come into it. So in the church of God right now, this on this earth, 
There is wheat and tares. There is things that come in that are unclean, but they're truly not in the truest sense in the church. Their names are not written in the book of life, even though they might be present in the physical church building. They're really not a part of the church. And in the future, nothing unclean, no one who practices abomination and lying shall ever come into it, but only those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. But, but for sure, this renewed earth, we're going to be here in renewed bodies, and um, we'll recognize each other, we'll be uh, glorified, so everyone will, while we'll be recognizable, there will be a glory to everybody, and um, perfection, and um, it's, it's, and yet we're gonna we're gonna have physical bodies. These physical bodies, they're, they're in a way, you you could say your body's eternal. I mean, in a sense, it's gonna decompose, and yet it's gonna come back together. And the Bible doesn't teach that uh, these bodies are gone, and then there's just some new body made. It talks about the resurrection of these bodies. So these bodies will be renewed, but. And it also says in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, um, we don't really quite know what they're going to be like because, I mean, we do, when we see Jesus, we, we, we do know what it's going to be like. And in a way, we don't fully know because it talks about a seed is different from the plant that grows up. So, yeah, so, so what about Israel? That's a really great question because um, you can c- completely interpret Revelation differently depending on your view of Israel. So, for instance... If you turn back to Revelation <clears throat> uh, chapter 4, I'll show you something. That's a great question, Steve. <clears throat> we just saw a couple of chapters here with messages to the churches, the seven churches, right? Philadelphia, Smyrna, Laodicea, and so on. <clears throat> and then in chapter 4, verse 1, it says, After these things I looked, and behold, the door standing open in heaven... And the first voice which I had heard, like the sound of a trumpet speaking with me, said, come up here and I will show you what must take place after these things. And how some people have interpreted this, and I I, I don't agree with this, but there's there's people have interpreted it this way, and, and, and so there are different ways people interpret this. I'm just giving you an old, old view of this during these classes. <clears throat> but what how they've interpreted it, all these chapters before were to the church. Chapter 1 talked about Christ in the midst of the, camp, the lampstands, which was the church. Then all these letters to the churches. And then it says, after these things, referring to the church, is how they interpret it. I looked and behold the door standing open in heaven and the first voice which I had heard like the sound of a trumpet speaking with me said, come up here. And I'll show you what's going to happen after. And people have interpreted that to mean, okay, this was about the church. Come up here, the rapture. And then I'll show you what's going to come after. And then so everything in the whole rest of the book is with the nation of Israel. <clears throat> and that's one way it's been interpreted. I, I don't agree with it. I, I just don't agree with it. There's too many. Uh, what that does, what that does is it takes the whole church age right up to the end of chapter 3, the whole 2,000 years of the church age, and nothing past chapter 3 applies to the church at all. And then everything from there, from, chap- from chapter 4 on, is during a seven-year period uh, to Israel. And we've looked at so many things already that apply to the earth. I mean, the, the, the horsemen going out, the, 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 the trumpets, the bowls, the, all the things that apply to the earth. There's so many things that apply to the whole church age. I, I, I just don't see it, but that's one way that people have interpreted it. Um, but as far as... Uh, as far as Israel actually goes, uh, what I believe about it, again, people don't have to agree with this, but what I believe about Israel is if, if we go into Romans, if we look at the last verse of 10 and then go right into 11, the last verse of 10 says, but as for Israel, he says, all the day long I've stretched out my hands to a disobedient people and an obstinate people. I say then God has not rejected his people, has he? May it never be, for I too am an Israelite, a descendant of Abraham, Of the tribe of Benjamin, God has not rejected his people whom he foreknew. Or do you not know what the scripture says in the passage about Elijah, how he pleads with God against Israel? Lord, they've killed your prophets and they've torn down your altars. And I alone am left and they are seeking my life. 
But what is the divine response to him? I have kept for myself 7,000 men who have not bowed to the knee of ba to Baal. In the same way, then there has also come to be at the present time a remnant according to God's gracious choice. But if it is by grace, it's no longer on the basis of works. Otherwise, grace is no longer grace. What then? What Israel is seeking is not obtained, but those who were chosen obtained it, and the rest were hardened, just as it is written. God gave them a spirit of stupor, eyes to see not and ears to hear not, down to this very day. And it keeps on going. <clears throat> and then it gets to a point where it says, uh, verse 25, For I do not want you, brethren, to be uninformed of this mystery, so that you'll not be wise in your own estimate, estimate, estimation that a partial hardening has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles also come in. And so all Israel will be saved, just as it is written. The deliverer will come from Zion. He will remove ungodliness from Jacob. This is my covenant with them when I take away their sins. And so it seems that there's going to be coming a time when even the, the, the nation of Israel has been hardened. It, it, it has rejected Christ. And yet it, it, God has preserved a remnant throughout the whole time. There's always been uh, people in Israel who have turned to Christ. But at the very end, when it talks about all being saved, um, it, it seems that at the very end there's going to come a time when there's going to be a gigantic a turning to Christ in the nation of Israel. And I, I think the Bible really does teach that. But yeah, as far as some prophecies concerning Israel, Galatians 6.16, I believe it is, Galatians, call, Galatians actually calls um, the, the church the Israel of God. And if we go into Romans Ah, oh, where's the address? Anyways, in Romans, it, it, it talks about um, it, it talks about Christians being sons of Abraham, and so there's a the, this real demarcation of Israel and the church. Israel was when Abraham came, God said to be the father of many nations, and he there was Israel and. When Israel rejected Christ, the, 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 well, the church came, and Paul was preaching to Israel. They, re, they, they rejected him, and he said in Acts, that, now, behold, I'm turning to the Gentiles, and so on. But Ephesians talks about the wall being knocked down, the wall of division between the Gentiles and Jews being gone, and there's no more Jew, no more Gentile, no more slave, no more free, you, you, you know, all that stuff. It, what, it, what it's saying is that there's, there's one church, whether you are from Israel or you're not from Israel, there's one church, one body of Christ, one Holy Spirit in all. And, and so this, the, the demarcation of Israel, while it does, the Bible does talk about Israel having a grand revival at the very end, this, this uh, where they make the church in Israel... Um, just like there's almost, some, some of these teachings make it sound almost like that, that, that they're so divided that like this part of the Bible is for the church, this part's for Israel. Um, it's almost as if the church has its own gospel and Israel has its own gospel. Some people actually teach that way. They say in the verse in Romans where uh, Paul says the words, my gospel. And he's just referring to the gospel. But um, some people have interpreted that there's even a different gospel for the church. So like Israel, the church, in so many ways being divided. Uh, the, the people that would teach that way would actually say all the way up to the cross, uh, that was for Israel. And then after that, it's the church until the rapture in Revelation chapter 4. And after that, it's all Israel. And so when you would look at, say, Matthew chapter 12, chapter 13, the Beatitudes, chapter 5, 6, 7, all these things, they would say that's for Israel. And so the church, we, we don't even need to look at that. If we look at that, it's like we're reading someone else's mail. Now, some of you guys have probably heard of some of this stuff. It's like a hyper-dispensationalism. A lot of you guys probably haven't. Well, that's good if you haven't. If you haven't, don't worry about it. But, but what I'm saying, there's there's... there's there's too much of a distinction made between Israel and the Gentiles when, when, God, when Christ himself, when, when the Holy Spirit inspired Paul to actually call the church the Israel of God and, 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 and calling, uh, like, who's the, who's the true circumcision? 
you know, it talks about that. Who's the true circumcision? And, and, and that's in Romans also. And, and you think of the circumcision being Israel. But in Romans it says the true circumcision is the one who believes in Christ. So I think we, we make a distinction that's too much. While, while we want to, uh, uh, you know, love Israel and, 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 and look at that God's going to restore Israel in the end with great revival, it appears. But, but, but making some of the distinctions that we do... Um, like, like I, I, I know right now when I, when I'd say that, that as Christians we're sons of Abraham, as Christians were, uh, Paul calls the church the Israel of God. There's people who would just absolutely, profoundly, say what I'm saying right now is really wrong. I can show you from Scripture that it's not, but, but, so, but there's that kind of teaching out there. We'll recognize them in the sense that when, when remember when Mary went into the tomb. And she came out of the tomb and she was weeping. And there was the, what she thought was the gardener standing there. And she asked Jesus, not knowing it was Jesus, where have you laid his body? And she's weeping and all of a sudden she looks and the Lord opens her eyes and, and she can see this is Christ. And she said, Rabboni. And she hugged him. Remember that? And, and we will be... I mean, God has made each of us uniquely individual people, and every one of us is the imager of God, and every one of us is precious in His sight. And so, when just as they recognize Jesus, they'll be able to recognize us. And so, you know, it, it, it doesn't matter if 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 a person, um, whether physical attributes on this earth are beautiful or not beautiful, when they're in heaven. They'll be beautiful and glorious and amazing and beyond anything we can imagine. And yet, they'll, they'll have the remnants of our own body so that, I mean, I'll be able to look at you and you'll be able to look at me and you'll, we'll know who we are. And so the, it, it, you're, it's like you're going to look like who you are and yet so glorified that we'll know who we are. We'll be able to see that that is, that is so and so, but I... I never could imagine the glory of how that person looks because God's going to take what he made and, and glorify it. And so the, the attributes of every single one of us, the, our characteristics, all the things we have, when God glorifies that, it's going to be just amazing. We'll be imagers of God and it'll be glorious and amazing, but recognizable. Does that make sense at all? So... It's, it's, uh, if you don't like how you look now, it, uh, it's. Well, I, yeah, they, they think, I mean, but once their eyes are open, then they do know. It's not, it's not like, it's not like he's, Christ didn't look so different that, that they didn't know who he was. They, they maybe not recognize right away, but I, I think they, I mean, the apostles, when he first appeared in the room, that those guys recognized him. But um, what, what Thomas was saying, unless I see the nail prints in his hands and I feel the wound in his side, I won't believe. So when, when Thomas saw him, I believe that Thomas actually did realize. But then Jesus said, place your hands, place your fingers in my, the nail prints in my hands and place your fingers in my side and believe and Thomas said, my Lord and my God. Remember that? So I, I don't think it was a matter of not recognition. I think it was uh, the Lord just affirming. I, I think that's how that was. They, but, but there's a way in which, at the same time, it's, it, Christ could be recognized or not recognized. Because remember, the, the two disciples were walking on the road to Emmaus. And Christ was walking with them. And, but... Christ was just, their hearts were burning in them as Christ was explaining the whole scriptures, how all the scriptures were pointing to Christ. And then when, and then when Christ left, the eye, the, 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 it's like the, their eyes were open and they realized it was Christ who was with them. But um, the, so there's a way where they recognized and didn't recognize both. But, and so you, you get the idea, we'll know who we are. We will definitely know who we are. So... That's true too. And I, th and I think the Lord was not letting them see who He was, on purpose. 
So, but yeah, um, you know, here, here's another example. When, when uh, at the Mount of Transfiguration, Peter and James and John went up the mountain with Christ and then the, and the Lord transfigured right before their eyes and, and went into a glorified state. And then Moses and Elijah were there. And they recognized, hey, that's Moses and that's Elijah. I mean, they, they, could, just, they could just see it. And so there's, we're, I don't know how we'll do that, but, but we will. We'll know who we, we'll know who we are. Um, we'll, we'll, we'll see our family. We'll see our friends. We'll see people we know for sure. But I, what's that? Exactly, exactly. We, we really can't. I mean, we can just guess at it, but we really can't fully grasp it because we really, we're, we're kind of, you know, I'm just saying a general statement, we'll recognize each other. I don't even want to say how I know we, how we will recognize each other. We, I mean, maybe we'll be so glorified well, after we're name tags. I don't know. But, <laughs> but, <laughs> but I mean, we're going to be really, it's going to be amazing. I, I can tell you that. We're just going to be absolutely amazing. I don't think we'll have to wear name takes. I think we'll know who we are. Yes. Certainly, our eyes will be open. We'll be able to. It, 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 yeah, it sure could be. God may just open our eyes so we understand that's who that is. Yeah, but we don't know for sure, do we? But we know it's going to happen. We we know it's going to happen because it will be. Literal people who are on the earth in heaven and, and will be the same people just glorified. So we're going to know each other. We're going to know each other. Other good questions. These are good. Other questions. Any questions? I didn't mean to say just good questions. We'll tell you what. Let's take a few minutes. Let's take a break. And then we'll come back and we'll look at the next chapter. There's, there's more unity. There's a unity through the whole Bible, isn't there? There really is. There's a unity through the whole Bible. And this, this, uh, this other view that, you, that you've been taught, um, the, again, the church age, rapture, seven-year tribulation, millennium, judgment, and then eternity. When you get something in, in your mind and, and you've gone over it many, many times over many, many years, and then someone comes along and shows you a, a different view, first of all, it can cause some skepticism and make you kind of, you know, and I, I, I get that. Um, so that's why when I, when I do this, I like to, to, to let you guys know this is an old view. Uh, some of the people that have held to it, um, just like even one of the greatest theologians has ever, one of the greatest systematic the, theology books written by one of the really great theologians is Louis Burkhoff. Uh, he's mentioned in William Hendrickson's book as one of the guys who holds to this old view. And, and so I guess just even knowing the, the history of how they thought like this is helpful just to know that. And, and if, if you realize that, okay, maybe I didn't know this view, maybe I was taught something different, but if I look back and see for centuries they believed a view like this, um, very, very, either right on or very close to what I'm saying, basically the gist of this was believed for centuries, then that can help you to um, realize, okay, maybe there really is something to this. And then you go through Scripture and you see how much it makes sense. And it, it really starts to fit, but... But as you read it, and you're used to thinking of another way, your brain's going to just kind of go where you're used to, and you, and you try to put something different in there, and it's, it's, it just takes a while. It's just confusing. Now, for me, it's hard to actually think the old way, which is actually thinking the new way, because that's the newer way, right? <laughs> so, but it's, it's, it's harder for me to go back and do that, because um, the simplicity of this view, the simplicity of it, um, just kind of, I mean, just in a real nutshell, just to kind of help you guys just uh, get it in your mind a little easier. Uh, the, here, here's the simplicity of this. Christ came. There's the church age. Throughout the whole church age, the Lord has given us, the, the gospel's gone out, that's the white horseman. It's followed by persecution, that's the red horse. Followed by uh, financial persecution and oppression, that's the black horse. And then just general death to Christians and non-Christians alike, that's the pale horse. And then throughout this whole church age, trumpets have blown to warn people to come to Christ. And bowls of wrath have been poured out where the Lord has just taken people into judgment. 
And then at the very end of this whole age where the Lord's been working all the way through when he's gathered in all his elect, he's going to return like a thief in the night. And it's going to be judgment, a general judgment. Sheep on the right, goats on the left. Wheat and tares separated. Rough fish and good fish separated. Eternity begins. Those who are lost and without Christ, second death, lake of fire. Those who are saved, new heavens, new earth. It's just that simple. It shows Christ working throughout the whole church age. It brings it to the end, the culmination, the judgment. Eternity begins. Very simplified view. And very scriptural view. What's really affirming about it, you think about the judgment instead of that view where um, there's like a judgment at the end of the seven-year tribulation and then a thousand years later there's another judgment and that kind of confusion you, where there's two different judgments and so on. You go, you, you just go look at well, what, what does it say in Matthew? And, and it gives all these parables. Sheep, goats, rough fish, good fish, wheat, tares, happening all at once. The angels were to gather up the tares, gather up the wheat, put the wheat in the barn, burn up the tares, all at once. And so all the parables match one judgment. Second Thessalonians chapter 1 talks about Christ returning in flaming fire with his mighty angels, exacting retribution on those who persecuted the Christian, Christians and glorifying the saints all at once. Again, one judgment. Then we see this idea of a thousand-year millennium. Or, or that gets really confusing. All of a sudden there's a rapture. Then there's seven years of tribulation. And then there's a thousand years on the earth. And somehow in that thousand years, the Christ is reigning. All the saints are reigning in glorified bodies, so they are without sin. They're glorified. And at the same time, people who have come through this seven-year tribulation, who are alive, who have not died, they're coming into this millennium in flesh bodies with sinful natures all together. And yet the Bible says, no flesh will be in my presence. That's in 1 Corinthians. No flesh will be in my presence, meaning no sinful flesh. When we're in the presence of God, we're going to be glorified. And it's talking about being in the presence of God. And so some of the things just don't even add up. And then, and then when there's a, a thousand-year reign and, and, and all these the, the glorified saints living for eternity... Who, who now we've been saved from sin and from death and from hell, and yet we got to live in a place where there's sin and death and Satan coming? It doesn't even match up with Scripture. It doesn't match up at all. It doesn't sound like a very good uh, millennium to me anyway. Um, when I think about being glorified and being with the Lord, sin and death and hell and the devil are done. And yet in that view of the millennium, there's sin and there's death and there's 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 basically uh, the Satan's being let let loose and going after the camp of the saints, and and yet he's already been defeated, and so it's, it's, it, the millennium to me does just does not even theologically match up to me with scripture. Then the really strange thing about that is then after the millennium it says there's a new heaven and a new earth. If 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 we were to, well, Keith gave me this timelines here, so you guys probably can't see this very good from there. Maybe you can. I don't know. Probably not. Okay, so here it is. Now, now get this straight, right? Get this. So what it's saying, there's the, there's the cross and the church age, rapture, seven-year tribulation, millennium. Okay? Here's something really interesting. If we look at the end of the church age before the millennium, if we look at, if, if we look at um, well, we, we see, how do I want to, how do I want to put this? Um, there is, I made a chart one time, and I don't have it, and I, I don't even know where it is. I'd have to remake it, but at the end of the millennium in Revelation, it talks about, a new heaven and a new earth for the first earth was destroyed. It's gone. That's in Revelation 20, right? We just looked at that. So the end of the thousand years, new heaven, new earth at the beginning of chapter 21. But we also see in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 10, at the end of the church age, the heavens and the earth being destroyed and burned up. 
So if, if you, here's the church age, here's the cross, I draw a line, here's the end of the church age, earth is blown up, burned up. Millennium, end of the millennium, earth is destroyed. Okay, so we see that happening twice. We, 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 we can look and we'll see at the end of the age persecution by Satan here and by Satan here. We can see um, the earthquake here and earthquake here. We can see battle of Armageddon, battle of Armageddon, and we realize it's talking about the same thing. And you just put them right over each other. It's talking about the same thing. It's just one judgment, one battle of Armageddon, one big earthquake, one uh, Satan being let loose. Does that make sense, you guys? It, 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 there's, a, there's a super simplicity to this old view, a real simplicity to it. That's what it does. Yeah, yeah. The, the, and, and, the, and the people who follow the, 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 the view that, that I'm talking about, if you wanted to put a name on it, it's was, it was called amillennialism. There's premillennialism, postmillennialism, amillennialism. The, the view I'm talking about, if you wanted to put a name on it, I haven't really been putting any name on it, but um, you would call it amillennialism. And... and um, so the millennium, they say ah, a like absent millennium. They're talking about this thousand years that's in the future. This isn't even there. This is the church age. That's why they call it amillennialism. I don't know if I like that name because you, you actually could say this is the thousand years. But whatever they call it, um, it's a very old view. It's a very simple view. But the accusations that come against those who would hold to this view would that would be that you spiritualize everything and you don't take anything literally. And the reason why that's not a fair accusation is this. If the the the, the people who hold to amillennialism actually are taking the Bible literally. But what what those who would not hold to this view, what they mean by literally, they mean you're looking at this and call it a symbol and not saying it's literal. What they mean by literal, they mean a wooden literal translation as if it's narrative literature versus symbolic literature. here's Here's a point to remember. This is a little hermeneutics lesson, a Bible interpretation lesson. Really important to know this. In the Bible, there is probably roughly, I'll just throw a number out there. I'm close. I don't know if I'm exact. But there's roughly 12 to 15 different types of literature. There's, par- par- there's parables, there's poetry, there's uh, didactic narrative, they call it. There's apocalyptic literature, there's prophetic uh, oracles, there's, there's, there's various types of literature. You can't take all these types of literature, put them over here, and interpret them all the same way. When you interpret them, all the same way, you misinterpret several of them. What happens is, it's just this is, this is just from English literature classes. Um, this is this is just how it is. What you do when you interpret any type of literature, first thing you want to do, if you want to get technical and do a really good job of it, is identify what type of literature you're interpreting. Is it poetry? Is it narrative? Is it symbolic apocalyptic literature? Is it a parable? What is it? Once you've identified what type of literature it is, then the second step is, what are the rules of interpretation for that kind of literature? They're not all like, take this literally. Take it literally according to its rules of interpretation. Let me give you an example, and I've, I've given this to you guys before, but you might not have all heard this, and it doesn't hurt to repeat something. But if we were to go to the book of Song of Solomon, let's just go there for a second. Is that okay? Song of Solomon.
Okay, so if we're in the Song of Solomon, and if anyone can find where Solomon is, is describing the Shulamite, let, let me know. Oh, yes, here we go. Is it, is it four? Chapter four? Okay, let's, let's do this. Okay, now let's do this, you guys. This will be fun. I wish we had an artist here. You know those guys, like at the, 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 you go to the fair and you sit down and they, and they draw your face real quick? Now, if we had someone like this, we could describe this and say, okay, you draw this. All right? So here's what we're going to do. I want you guys, I'm going to read this. And I want you to pretend you don't know what kind of literature this is. So I want you to interpret this literally, wooden literalism. Okay? So here it is. How beautiful you are, my darling. How beautiful you are. Your eyes are like doves behind your veil. Okay, so now, so now you draw, okay, you draw a, a, the shape of a head and you draw a couple little doves. Your hair is like a flock of goats. So it's like I'll just draw these goats running down the side of the head that descend from Mount Gilead. Your teeth are like a flock of newly born ewes. So I'll draw these little sheep in here, which have come up from their washing, all of which bear twins. In other words, none of them are missing, no missing teeth. And not one among them has lost her young. Now, if we're doing this literally, if we're doing this literally, we got all these sheep, right? Right between the lips. And goats coming down the side of the head and doves right here, right? Now, let's, let's keep going. So imagine that. Your lips are like a scarlet thread. Your mouth is lovely. Your temples are like a slice of pomegranate behind your veil. Your neck is like the Tower of David. So here's this big brick tower. Built with rows of stones on which hung a thousand shields. So put all these shields on here. You guys get the idea? You get the idea, right? That's what wooden literalism is. Now let's interpret this like poetry. Because isn't this poetry? How beautiful you are. Your eyes are like doves. Your eyes are soft. Your eyes are soft, gentle. Your hair's like a flock of goats. You know, I don't know what they meant by that. <laughs> I think it meant something beautiful, though. I don't think of beauty when I think of goats, but your teeth are like a flock of newly shorn ewes which have come up from their washing, all of which which bear twins, and not one of them has lost her young. Okay, well, that's so poetic. When it, when it says your, your teeth are like newly shorn ewes, they're just white, coming up from the washing, all of which bear twins. In other words, all the teeth are, they're, 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 there's top and bottom, there's twins. Not one of them has lost her young. She just, she's got white teeth and she's not missing any teeth. None of them, lost, she hasn't lost her young. Poetically, it means that she's just got a beautiful smile. Does that make sense? But you would never come up with that if you didn't know this is poetry. But because it's poetry, it's completely different meaning than narrative, isn't it? It's completely different meaning. I mean, a hundred percent different meaning. One would be like a grotesque monster, and one like a, just a beautiful woman with soft eyes and a beautiful smile. See the difference between interpreting poetry and didactic narrative. So if I go and I and I go into some type of literature. And I think everything is literal in the sense of didactic literature, like a mechanics manual. I'm going to read it just exactly what it says. I'm going to get a lot of the types of literature in the Bible wrong. But if I first understand what literature is, and then I interpret according to the rules of literature, of that type of literature. So the rules of poetry, the rules of poetry are you don't interpret poetry like didactic narrative. You don't interpret poetry in a wooden literal sense. You interpret poetry, you see, you see a picture. The poetry draws you a picture. And you look at that picture and you interpret that picture. Eyes like a dove. Soft, beautiful eyes. Okay, so if you understand that now, and you go to the book of Revelation, you see immediately in chapter 1, within the first few sentences, that this book is symbolic. Right off the bat, in the first few verses, it's, it, Paul, John comes right out and says, he's, you know, he saw a vision. I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. 
He's seeing a vision. And in that vision, when he says he sees the seven spirits before the throne, if we go into didactic narrative, liter- literal interpretation, wooden interpretation, you're going to go and realize all of my theology, all of my doctrine has taught me that there's one Holy Spirit. Now all of a sudden, Revelation says there's seven spirits before the throne of God. Which is it? I'm confused. But if I go to Revelation and I realize this is symbolic literature, and I know from all of Scripture there's only one Holy Spirit, and I read there's seven spirits before the throne, I immediately realize the number seven is the number of perfection. And this, is, this isn't talking about the numerical number of, 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 of spirits before the throne. As a vision, he sees these seven spirits, and it's talking about the Holy Spirit, and seven being the number of perfection is talking about the the perfect Holy Spirit in all his attributes. Does that make sense, you guys? And so, so when I go to the book of Revelation and I realize this whole book is a, is a book of visions that's meant to give a message of revelation to the church, and every part of, I read about it, I can tell it's visions. I can, one, it says it's visions, and two, just the things it describes. Like, like, like when, it, when, they're, when they're talking about the, Warfare with a, a horse and, and, and um, you know, it describes this. I'd have to go back and look. I, I don't remember exactly the details of it, but, but, but it's like the tail has, um, look, has, has certain things that it's different from a normal horse, and so does the head, like maybe like a lion. And, and part, one of the symbols talks about hair like a woman and, a, and teeth like a lion. And I'm just, I'm, I got it all mixed up. You guys, we could go and look it up and read it exactly. You know what I'm talking about. If we take that literally, we're going we're gonna to imagine these types of creatures on the earth. We're going to imagine this kind of stuff happening. And, and, and it's because we're reading this, putting it all under one type of literature, narrative literature, narrative interpretation, didactic literature, they call it. Reading it like a mechanics manual. And the moment we take symbolic literature and put didactic narrative rules on it, we're going to get the wrong message. But the moment we realize this is symbolic literature, vision literature, apocalyptic literature, and it's meant to give symbols that mean something, then if we guard ourselves and make sure we understand we're looking at a symbol, what does this mean? And when you look at a symbol, you don't, you don't overanalyze all the details. You look at the big picture. It paints a picture almost like poetry. It paints this big picture. And what does this picture mean? I don't have to get into the details of, of why are the teeth like a lion's? Why is a woman's like a... The, the hair like a woman. Well, I don't have to get it. I just see this picture. I see this creature. I see this thing. And, and you realize by the context it's talking about warfare. And so what is actually being more literal, literal and true to the text? It's being more true and literal to the text by interpreting whatever literature you're reading according to the rules of interpretation for that kind of literature. Same with a parable. The rules of interpretation for a parable are this. A parable draws a picture, and it's meant to give one meaning. It's meant to drive a point. So I can read about the Good Samaritan, and I can read about the Levite coming by and and staying away from the the, the guy who was beat up, and, and the priest coming by and staying away, and all of a sudden the Samaritan comes by. And the Samaritans despised. That's why Jesus used the Samaritans. They were despised by the Jews. But the Samaritan picks this guy up and he, and he bandages him up and he puts him on his, on his mule and he brings him down to the inn and he, and he, he brings him in the inn and he puts him in the inn and he tells, tells the inn, innkeeper, take care of this guy. When I come back, uh, if I owe anything, I'll pay you. And he gives him two coins. And, and then Jesus says, which person in this parable was his neighbor? And it was a Samaritan. And the whole point of that parable wasn't like, well, what do those two coins mean? I've, I've, seen, where, I've seen where people have taken this and said, the, okay, the two coins mean the Old Testament and the New Testament. And someone else says, no, they mean baptism and communion. And the, the Levite, he, he, he was talk, this, this was talking about something with the Old Testament. And the priest was talking about, and it just goes on and on. It makes all these, just all these things by overanalyzing this. And that's kind of what people can do with Revelation didn't mean any of those things. All it meant was, who's my neighbor? 
The neighbor is the guy that's right next to you that needs to be loved on, who needs to be helped. Period. The whole point of the narrative. The whole point of the parable. That's how you interpret a parable. If you interpret a parable any other way, you're not interpreting it correctly. That's how all the literature is in Scripture. You need to determine what kind of literature am I reading and what are the rules of interpretation for that kind of literature. Then you're going to find the meaning. You're going to find out what did the author intend to convey to the reader. That's how you're going to find it out. And so that's why we get in so much trouble in the book of Revelation. That's kind of a long story, but does that make sense? So you go to the book of Revelation, and, and so, so the amillennialist is accused of not being literal. And I, as an amillennialist, I say, well, I'm literal according to the rules of interpretation for this kind of literature. But I'm not literal if you mean literal like interpreting it like a narrative, because it's not a narrative. So that's what I'm talking about. Yeah, right? yeah, they need. Isn't that what I came about? Yeah, yeah. Who is my neighbor? Yeah. And they needed to know. And Jesus was telling them using a parable to drive a point because parables are made to drive a point. Your neighbor is the one who's next to you that needs your help. Yeah, good. That's good. And so I guess we won't do twenty-two tonight because we need to stop. So I guess we're going to have one more meeting of Revelation. Um, if you guys are okay with it, but next Sunday I don't know that we'll do it next Sunday. We may. We may not. Depends how uh, worn out we all are from the conference. So we'll announce it. We'll announce it. But um, uh, I hope this was helpful anyway, to, just to go over this literature stuff a little bit to help you understand why. So, so you understand why if someone says an amillennialist is spiritualizes everything and an amillennialist doesn't take things literally, uh, that, that's not being very technical. An amillennialist goes to the Scripture determines what kind of literature it is, and then interprets according to that, the rules of that type of literature. That's all it is. And so it's, it, it, it's, it would be, if an amillennialist is accused of not taking things literal, um, it'd be like going to Song of Solomon and, and taking the Shulamite in a literal sense, and you guys can see that don't work. So we got we to gotta just... What kind of literature are we reading? What are the rules for interpreting it? Let's, you guys have been great coming here. I really appreciate you coming. We'll let you know next Sunday morning if we're going to meet next Sunday night or wait the, the following week, depending on what the, the, the conference and so on. But let, let's close in prayer, and we'll call it a night. Lord, thank you that we could be here tonight looking at your word. We just thank you for your word. We thank you for the revelation. We thank you, Lord, that we are your church and that you love us, and that you hold us secure, uh, that, that your, your church symbolically has high walls, Lord, that we're safe in your hands, and no one can snatch us out. We pray, Father, we grow in our walk with you, and uh, Lord, we love you, and we praise you, and we ask for travel mercies as we go home. Lord, we pray in Jesus' name, amen.